uh, we can counter only weapons that we have to counter is first of all uh, to have uh, uh, less and less infiltration uh, of our institutions. This is the number one problem in Ukraine. There was at least before the change and hopefully they're going to solve this. The institutions, specifically security and defense institutions, were infiltrated by the Russian influenced uh, people and cadre. The second of course is uh, right handling of the uh, intelligence uh, apparatus because uh, the early warning that you need to have is not going to be available from you, from the partners, if they are not reliable, if you are not reliable in that sense. So this is the two fields they need to have the improvement. The, sec the third and probably major one is the motivation. Motivation uh, of the armed forces, motivation of society uh, to fight for their own country. And this means that you have to have the strong ideology and uh, identity uh, conscious. I think that what happened is very tragic, of course, what's happening in Ukraine, but it helped them to get their self-identity. And I think Ukrainians are moving forward now to put together, it's tough, but eventually uh, it will happen, uh, the, uh, the armed forces, security forces that will be able to defend their country. Now, for, it cannot be done only by Ukrainians. This, this is why Georgia probably and Poland, I'm gonna, I had a meeting with the Polish counterpart just a minutes ago, we take it very painfully what's happening there because we went through it and uh, we know how hard it is to, to have such a warfare with the Russian Federation. So transferring all the experience that we gained, I commissioned the lessons learned from 2008 war and the results were already passed through the Ukrainians. Well, we're going to also help them how to build the institution of defense, which is going to be transparent, which is going to be really uh, the, uh, um, under the uh, civilian and political control of the government, which we already successfully made, and NATO said that we can export this uh, kind of institutional knowledge to other countries like Ukraine. And of course, uh, then it comes to NATO. It's not about the preparedness of Georgia, for say, at this point. Everybody agrees that technically Georgia qualifies. Interoperability there is their contribution, is their political system is mature. Uh, except we have, of course, the occupied territories, which can be dealt uh, if political will will be there, because uh, Germany was taken in, into alliance while the Soviet occupation was happening in the eastern part of Germany. So there is a ways how to deal with this. But we need to have the political will of, uh, of the West. And here comes, I think, uh, the main challenge, because the threat perception is very different in uh, Washington, in Brussels, in Berlin, and in Georgia, or in other Eastern European countries. So we have to narrow this gap, and this is where it's going. I feel it because through the dialogue that we have today with the leaders, I mean, everybody understands now that uh, at this point at least, uh, to uh, put Russia in a basket of the partners uh, is not realistic. So this is why what you see what is happening now between uh, uh, allies. They're putting together the response force uh, Georgia will be part of NATO response force from, from 2015. Uh, more assets, defensive assets uh, in the uh, eastern part of the Euro-Atlantic community. And more uh, training and more uh, presence of NATO uh, in political, security and other fields uh, in the partners which are aspiring to become the members. So this is the way to go, I think. Another question for you? Over there. No, no, second row here. Thank you very much. I am Vasile Rotaro. I am from Moldova. I just wanted to ask you to detail a bit how would you deal with Abkhazia and Ossetia? Would you just not apply Article 5 to these regions, or do you have any other solutions? If you could detail it. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Maybe we'll just take one last question. And I'd like to ask about the training center that you mentioned. Okay. Can you give a little bit more information? It will be like a, a COE, like a think tank, or it will give uh, training expertise yeah. in uh, uh, military? Or? Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'll start with the last question. It's going to be a military training facility uh, when, uh, na where NATO members, Georgia, and partner countries will uh, train. Uh, it's going to be, uh, there, there's a lot of suggestions. We have already the Tanisi training base, which already was used f for years by U.S. Marines to train Georgians. And by the way, almost 12, 
thousands of Georgian troops were trained in pre-deployment to Afghanistan and other missions at that place. It's already equipped. It's all the logistical side is more or less in shape, and we're going to invest more now in this. So uh, the implementation of all this package will be under the control uh, by the undersecretary, uh, uh, undersecretary Wershbo. So we're going to put together the package, package, and then implementation plan. Uh, now, uh, uh, on the issue of the conflicts, well, there is no other alternative other than just peaceful political settlement. We declared on all the levels that there is no military solution to this. 20 years passed in the conflict, I think there is enough goodwill, I would say, among the societies of Georgians Georgians to start thinking about how we can coexist together. And I have... Uh, my own actually contacts with the Abkhaz side. And I feel that uh, there is a room for the reconciliation. First of all, we are putting our efforts declaratively now on infrastructure, humanitarian assistance, healthcare, joint uh, healthcare projects with Abkhaz and Ossetians, and it's working already. Uh, trade, I think economy and trade is key to conf uh, conflict resolution. Uh, so they now understand that we're not gonna ever try to resolve this conflict through military means because they see our force posturing, they are seeing our rhetoric, which was very different three, four years ago. And now we're putting together this uh, package of uh, the uh, reconciliation. Of course, Russia is trying to block that. Russia is trying to put the barbed wires. For past year, they were only doing that, but it's not serving their own image. And the Abkhaz and Ossetias are fed up with them because the promised prosperity is not happening. 70% of all the money that is coming from Russia ending up in pockets of, corrupt pockets of Russian militaries. They're not happy with that. And I'm pretty sure if we're gonna stay the course, if they're gonna see Georgia solidly, unshakably on a path of European uh, membership and NATO membership, they will see their future better with Georgians in Europe rather than stay under the Russian occupation. This is the core of our uh, reconciliation policy. It will take time, but we need to be patient because it's easy to start war, but then it's quite tough to put people together that there's a lot of blood. But although 20 years passed, and uh, now I think we're entering the time when this is possible. Of course, we need to be more uh, engaging with the European Union on other uh, reconciliation and the projects of uh, infrastructural nature. We need to put more European footprint in Abkhazia and Skin Valley region. This is the idea. And uh, we're talking with Europeans a lot about this. Anything. I mean, uh, we, we, what we're doing now that we declare that there's not going to be war, we're not going to resolve this conflict through the military means. Second, we're opening up every border that is there just to interact, people to people yep. contact, trade, as I mentioned, the healthcare projects together. And uh, time will come when we're going to be ready for the political dialogue. Mm -hmm. So we're not touching this issue at this point. Geneva is moving forward. Actually, it's not moving forward. This format is there but nothing is happening because everything is blocked on the political side, but that's okay, that's the reality. We need to be patient, it will take time, but eventually, I mean, Georgia is around for three millennium, and we've been chopped up and stitched back again for hundreds of times, so it's gonna happen again. Okay, one last question and then we're... Hi, I'm I'm Polish and I work for the EU. Um, I have a question because you said something about the transfer of experiences to Ukraine, that right. uh, you are working on that, and I'm very happy to hear that because I think this is one of the major gaps, at least from the EU perspective, that the regional cooperation so far uh, between all the states, uh, it's not so strong. So I wanted to ask you about your uh, view on potential, um, uh, potential cooperation between other states as well in the region, and how do you see uh, if the situation that is now there uh, uh, is kind of flourishing kind of regional cooperation between yeah. the states and the transfer of knowledge. Well, I agree with you that we need to put as much security arrangements and layers in the region as, mu as much as we can. And of course, uh, Ukraine is one issue that we're concentrating our efforts at this point, but at the same time, we're working for Caucasus regional cooperation as well. I just started, we just started uh, two weeks ago, the defense trilateral cooperation with Turkey and Azerbaijan two strategic partners for us uh, on defense uh, issues. Uh, mainly, this is not against anybody. This is to protect the critical infrastructure, 
gas and oil pipelines and railroad in the in, uh, in event of emergency, how are we going to defend them? Uh, and at the same time, Georgia is fortunate to have very good and neighborly relationship with Armenia. And possibly Georgia, we, have, we think that we have a potential to being a convening place for the Azeris and Armenians to come together because we are also having good bilateral, even military educational um, ties with Armenians. Of course, they choose different security kind of guarantors, but that's the, uh, that's the uh, matter of time, I think. I'm pretty sure the whole, what we're doing in Caucasus, all this route and tra transfer corridor, a Silk Road, cannot be complete without Armenia. And we all understand that. Azeris understand it's going to take time. Uh, but of course, uh, we need to go ahead and press what we have now and to protect the infrastructure. So this is one layer of the arrangements. Of course, Black Sea cooperation. Now we're also Saudi and uh, Defense Ministerial Cooperation. We're going to be members in a month or so. We're going to be accepted as a member. So we're putting everything together. We are getting along pretty much with everybody except Russians at this point. Thank you, Mr. Minister. You've, uh, you've raised a number of very important um, issues, but uh, something that worries me is, uh, is political will in NATO. As you said, technically Georgia is ready for the membership, but there is the lack of political will. I guess till the next uh, summit of NATO, it's the big task that you and other governmental officials in Georgia have to deal with. So how sure. do you see the progress in that? Well, President Obama's statements uh, in Estonia about the Operdom policy was very important and encouraging. The billion uh, dollar reassurance package to Europe is also encouraging, so they're acting. And I think uh, Germany's positions uh, for the past uh, months about how to deal uh, with uh, Russia and how they're supporting the active measures of, uh, uh, of sanctions, it means that there is a shift in the, in the understanding of uh, the scale and uh, of uh, the threat that is coming from Russia. Of course, there is no military solution to this. We all understand that. We need to avoid the military confrontation with Russia. Last thing we want to have military confrontation between NATO and, uh, uh, and Russia, but there is other effective means of dealing with this. But only sanctions also will not be uh, sufficient. So that's where we're talking. Sanctions with the smart combinations of the military deterrent, which is putting defensive capability on the ground, locking down everything that can be saved at this point, for Russians will think twice before entering Georgia or other places. Thank you, Mr. Minister. It was a pleasure to host you. It was a pleasure. It was it's fast. I'm sorry I was late, but it we're was not really our fault. running out of time. Yes. So. so, good luck, all of you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
The Dutch foreign minister has just arrived, so give us one minute to get him mic'd up and we'll get underway. Uh, and we're going to have uh, a surprise guest joining as soon as we conclude with the Dutch foreign minister as well. So uh, they'll be in just shortly. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Vasil Marchenchenko. I'm strategic communications advisor from Ukraine. I'm also a co-founder of Ukraine Crisis Media Center, an outfit which was set up in early March with the aim of countering Russian propaganda and helping Ukrainian government communicate the present, present, various pressing issues in Ukraine, especially the current war with Russia. I'm very pleased and delighted to be moderating this panel here. Uh, on the world in turmoil, and we will aim to actually address a much broader picture of various issues globally and how NATO should react to them and what should be the NATO's response to those issues. Firstly, I would like to introduce our panel. Uh, we are very happy to have Franz Timmermans, the Dutch foreign minister here. Uh, Mr. Timmermans is the, the Dutch politician and diplomat. He's from the Labour Party. Uh, he's been in politics for quite a while. He became an MP in 1998. Later on, he served in the government as a state secretary for foreign affairs for four years. And then later on, he rejoined the government in 2012 as a foreign minister. Mr. Timmermans, we're very happy to have you here. Also, uh, we are having Barry Powell, a vice president and director of the Atlantic Council, the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security. And uh, Barry has enormous experience of working in the US uh, Pentagon and as well as the White House as an advisor on uh, security and defense issues. Very happy to have Mary here. And also, uh, we are having here in a panel of a fellow delegate from the, the Fu NATO Future Summit, uh, Tobias Bunde. He's the head of policy and research at the Munich Security Conference. So I, I suggest the following uh, timeline. We have each of the speakers talk for five, six minutes, and then we will uh, open a discussion with uh, Q&A. So the floor is yours, Mr. Uh, Minister. Do you want me to start? Yes, please. Um, can I sit here? Do you want me to stand there? No, just, just sit, sit here. here. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, good afternoon um, to all of you, uh, our future leaders. Um, it's my pleasure to talk to you today. Uh, we have some very pressing security issues in Europe uh, at this stage, and it's uh, quite a challenge to to NATO. And I, I think um, we should be looking uh, specifically at Europe's neighbourhood uh, in the east and in the south um, for two main reasons. First of all, um, the threat uh, posed by Russia is imminent. Um, it is not just because of Russia's activities um, uh, on the Crimea and later in eastern Ukraine. It's also because of the whole ph philosophy behind those activities. The, the logic followed by the Kremlin is a direct threat to our security. And not just the security since the end of the Cold War, even the security in the decades before the end of the Cold War, which at least uh, assured uh, the respect of national borders. Uh, and even that principle has been violated grossly by uh, the Russian Federation. Um, 
behind all this uh, in Russia is uh, this idea that Russia is um, a specific case. It's not a European nation, it's not an Asian nation, it's a Russian nation. It's the, it's the uh, modern version of the Slavophile philosophy of the 19th century. And um, it regards us, the other Europeans, especially today, as weak, um, morally corrupt, um, and all these other things that um, fall into, into the category of of being less as a culture, which is part of the Slavophile approach. Um, so, starting from the assumption that we are weak and uh, we can be bullied into um, uh, not reacting to aggressive behavior. That is the whole philosophy behind it. And the challenge we see now is a challenge to show determination, to show resolve, to show that we will not be deterred from defending what we hold very dear. And it starts in, for NATO in reassuring our Eastern member states, where not just governments, but especially the populations are extremely worried about developments in Russia. And the reassurance we need to give is that we will stand by them whatever happens. And we will not allow any other nation to um, destabilize a NATO member state. And we have to prepare our public opinion that this is not for free, that this, is, this requires uh, an investment in our defense, it requires political determination, it requires the willingness to suffer economic uh, consequences for this attitude. And I believe we are not ready yet um, to see the full scale of what will be necessary. And also, we don't understand yet um, how long it will take to make sure this threat goes away permanently. The second, and I, you know, if, if there are questions on this issue, I'll gladly answer them. The second issue I want to briefly uh, talk about is, of course, the situation in the Arab world. Here again, uh, very fundamental changes, um, a logical and natural process of emancipation of a young generation, better educated than before, but still excluded from large parts of the economy of society in the Arab world, demanding access challenging the powers that be, and then being sort of um, misused, captured, um, manipulated by forces that are pure evil, such as uh, ISIL or whatever you want uh, to call them. Um, and this is a tragedy, this real feeling of reform, of wanting a different society, wanting more opportunity, of wanting to break through existing patterns of corruption and, and, and exclusion of large parts of the population, then manipulated into what we now see with ISIL or ISIL, or whatever you want to call them. This is a direct threat to the Arab world. It's also a direct threat to our part of the world. Because, not just because of the people recruited here and somehow um, uh, enchanted into believing this ideology, but also because there is a direct idea that, that destabilizing our societies might be useful to them. So they're willing to train um, terrorists and send them back to Europe, um, especially those terrorists born in Europe, um, to try and wreak havoc on our society. So that is also a direct threat to our security, not a threat we can face with traditional means, but we will have to win back hearts and minds of people living in our own society and we will have to help those communities struggling with highly educated young, especially men, but also women, who somehow are captivated by a nihilist, uh, dark ideology that will only lead to, to, to death and destruction. And so the challenge is to face a th threat there and make sure that it can't spread in the Arab world, but also to face the threat here and in that sense, there is sort of a new ideological confrontation, even in Europe, which is completely different from what we saw in the, in the, in the, in the Cold War, but which has the same sort of implications. Um, the only, and I'll finish on that, the only parallel I see, if you look at the types of persons who are you know, recruited into this sort of terrorism, the parallel I see is with the 1970s and the Red Brigade and uh, Bader-Meinhof groups, where also they had the highly educated people from 
well-to-do or relatively well-to-do backgrounds, middle classes being sort of captivated by a nihilist ideology, refuting, uh, refuting society as it is, and re wanting to replace this by a totalitarian system. And I think this fundamentalist um, Islam is just as totalitarian as the um, uh, ultra-left communist or whatever you want to call them ideology of, of the terrorist groups in Germany and Italy in the 1970s. And therefore, you cannot win this struggle, this ideological struggle, without the support of the communities within which uh, this fight is fought. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Indeed, the threat of Russia and their 19th century behavior are there, and as well as the um, rise of ISIS and the new challenges in the Middle East, uh, some pressing issues. And, uh, and I would like to pass the floor to Barry Bowell to further elaborate on this issue, as well as um, some other additional questions and topics, please. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here and to follow the minister. I think I, for the first time in a very long time, I've, I agreed with every single word that you said. Uh, first time that, that I've agreed with every single word of a panelist I've been with. That was a very, uh, I thought, extremely powerful rendering of what, um, what we're seeing. I was sort of asked to look at this from a US perspective, and I'll expand this to sort of a global strategic uh, viewpoint, uh, reflecting some of the work at the Atlantic Council. It's sort of, it's our contention that the, the current global order is crumbling, and we're talking about um, sort of evidentiary points that flow from that, um, from that one, uh, one hypothesis. There's a relative shift of power away from Europe and the United States back to Asia and elsewhere, and I think that's why you're seeing some of the trends playing out. And then there's also a much more novel shift to, uh, uh, of power to individuals and groups, which I'll sort of end on. But first, sort of the, the interstate power shift. Uh, there's a lot of, rec of dynamism in Asia, uh, economic, but also increasingly security tensions and concerns. Uh, you're well aware of the US strategy that sort of shifts to Asia. I won't use the P word. Uh, uh, but certainly those are real military and security requirements, uh, real, Im real potential impacts on the global economy if there is a conflict, and it's, it's, it looks pretty dicey sort of by the week with different um, sorts of conflicts and crises playing out. Uh, in my view, sort of stepping back, this is uh, a rising power, China, testing the rules and the norms of an international order that it had no role in establishing, I'm not, condone, I'm not condoning it, but I'm saying you're seeing a lot of probes from China regarding, in particular, maritime uh, legal regimes. Uh, and it, I think it will continue to probe until it faces some uh, very uh, uh, coherent pushback, not unlike the, what, we, what, what, what is partly required in Europe. In the Middle East, I think you're seeing the spread of disorder which I'll talk about a bit at the end, and that's not likely to go away anytime soon. And then in Europe, I think we are seeing a, 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 a regional power, Russia, which is, again, uh, making clear through its behavior that it's, it has no plan or intention to respect what we thought were the rules and norms of the European security order, certainly since the end of the, since the, end of the Cold War. So I think now, if, you, if you're a US strategist or planner, you're now seeing the possibility of three regions that could, could present real security requirements. This is new. This hasn't happened for quite a while. And I think it's unfortunate a bit in terms of timing that the US uh, defense just was published in March or April, was published right before the crisis in Ukraine got a little, got hot. And so I don't think it accounts for the real and very, uh, um, very uh, significant military requirements associated with a potential uh, war, um, a, a potential NATO Article 5 operation. So I think those planners are going to have to soon, if they haven't already, go back to the drawing board um, and relook how the US might handle sort of these three nearly simultaneous uh, potential problems. I do think, despite all the rhetoric out of Washington about uh, sequestration, and budget reductions, which I do think are important and, and very constraining. Uh, the global military capacity of the United States military is still predominant. And you, you should not sort of confuse the, the political rhetoric in Washington with the actual military capacity of the United States military to undertake uh, extremely significant military operations. But there are real questions right now about US will to use military force, US will to deter 
and to underwrite its security commitments. And I think those need to be redressed in any uh, discussion of this sort. Um, it does suggest the need for a, a renewed transatlantic bargain with all of these requirements, with all of this flux. I think this could be an important time for the United States, Canada, and Europe to relook with, with some real vigor its plans and its strategy for handling the different uh, challenges that I thought the minister just laid out very well. Let me end on what I think is the new part of what we're seeing, and that is uh, an order that we are now calling the Westphalian plus world. In other words, for 350 years, we've sort of enjoyed uh, an international system where the nation state was by far the most dominant actor. And I think what you're seeing, what you're starting to see now with ISIS, but there's also positive, positive implications, is this trend of individual empowerment, where individuals under, um, undergirded by a range of technologies, we've only seen one sort of in the last 10 years, the communications revolution. We have another four coming. The next one that the Silicon Valley experts tell me is the bio revolution which will make this look pretty small. We're talking about writing the code for life. We're talking about extending human longevity, about uh, super empowered individuals in terms of their own biology, um, in terms of uh, human enhancement and bio, uh, uh, human computer interface, brain computer interfaces. There's a whole range of technologies, additive manufacturing, that are gonna really give groups uh, a lot more power to take action on a strategically significant scale in their country in their region or in the world. This could be a very, very prosperous and secure world if we recognize those changes and seek to harness them because I think ultimately they're in the advantage of, of Europe and the United States if we are, are sort of agile enough to understand what's going on and not only seek stability because there's a lot of change going on that we also need to harness for our own national advantages. And I think I'll end on that note. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Thank you for your insights. And, uh, Tobias? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, am I supposed to disagree now? I think that's, uh, that's gonna be hard, but um, I'd like to offer a certain, another aspect to it. Um, you're of course right that um, the Ukraine crisis is not about Ukraine itself. It's probably also not about the principles, the fundamental principles of the international order. I think the Ukraine crisis is also about us as the West and about the level of ambition we stick to or that we define. Um, one can argue, for instance, that this kind of crisis can also be a crisis in the sense that it will return um, our focus to Europe, and that's the danger I see, that there are many countries here in Europe that have some kind of opportunity to refocus on Europe, to go back to some kind of traditional NATO, focusing on our direct neighborhood, and then some kind of um, ignoring the, the many challenges you outlined too. Um, one might argue that the West is now entering some kind of new era of post-interventionism. Um, that could be a possibility. Um, but on the other hand, I think that is also, it's not just that, that uh, Putin or that ISIS um, see the West as weak, divided and so on. It may be also true that we in the West we see ourselves uh, as weak and divided. But we could also use this crisis as an opportunity in the sense that I think a former White House chief of staff um, was said to have remarked, like, never waste a crisis. So there's, there's always this kind of opportunity, and I think that's what we've seen uh, in a run-up to the summit to a certain extent, because that ki the kind of... Uh, new instruments that NATO is developing are usually instruments that you can use for uh, defending uh, countries such as the Baltic countries, for instance, but also uh, instruments that can be used in other areas of the globe. Um, since I have to disagree uh, here, I think I, I, I try to disagree with uh, what uh, the Secretary General uh, said this morning. He said, NATO is not a global alliance, but an alliance with a global perspective. Uh, I wish he was right, but I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think um, I remember a German Minister of Defense just uh, uh, talking to an audience in Berlin uh, last year, and he said, so well, basically, I don't see any role for NATO uh, in the Asia-Pacific. Um, there's no role to play uh, for Germany because we don't have uh, security interest as a country that is uh, 
uh, yeah, the second biggest exporting nation. It's a surprising statement, but this is also not, not only true for Germany, but also for other countries in Europe. Um, that this is, in fact, the wrong uh, outlook is, is basically underlined uh, by a visit by the Japanese Prime Minister, I think. He came to NATO in June or so, and uh, he was talking to uh, Secretary General, and he was also talking about Ukraine. And basically what he was saying is, when I look at Ukraine, what I see is basically disputes in the Asia Pacific because it's it's about these orders, uh, the, the liberal international order, and I think that, that the West, so basically still the United States and the European Union, are still indispensable for upholding this this order. And um, I hope that this summit here in Wales will be the first step in in making clear that we still think that we can do uphold this order. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tobias. Um, of course, as somebody from Ukraine, I, 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 and I, I feel pleased and happy that almost each panel here, we, we mention Ukraine, but still I would like to say a couple of words about my sort of perspective on this. And I think what has happened uh, with uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine, that not only the security system in Europe was undermined, the whole global security was undermined, because uh, as just a reminder, in the early 90s, uh, 90s Ukraine had the uh, nuclear stockpile, which would, was equal to the combined stockpile of China, France, and Britain combined. And Ukraine is the only country in the world which unilaterally and voluntarily uh, gave up its nukes. Uh, and uh, in exchange for the assurances which were given by Russia, UK, and the US of its territorial integrity. So it has been violated, and uh, it's, uh, that, that was breached. But my question is, how do we work on the nuclear non-proliferation in the world now, which country which is currently developing the nuclear program, or which countries already have nuclear, would actually voluntarily give them up if they see the example of Ukraine. That's one thing. Secondly, all the territorial disputes, uh, they can be reignited because by taking over Crimea, uh, Russia is creating a world precedent for many other countries to do a similar thing and uh, use similar arguments. And, um, we never know what's in, currently China, as Barry has mentioned, they are uh, working heavily and you know, infringing some of the maritime legal regimes, but they may actually annex some territories, which they feel are historically Chinese, and there are you know, large Chinese populations there. Or you never know what Argentina can do next. They may take over the Falkland Islands and claim, which they've always claimed it's in Argentinian territory. So basically the whole global world order is undermined. And this is, of course, a huge challenge for, for NATO and all the Western powers. Uh, but coming back to, to, to Holland, and uh, I would like to have a question to Mr. T Timmermans. Uh, I was very lucky to be present at the international conference hosted by your prime minister at the end of April. That was a uh, liberal international congress. And I was um, lucky to be on the panel on Ukraine. And uh, I shared my views of, on the developments in Ukraine. And the sentiment, there were a lot of distinguished uh, politicians from Holland, apparently, there in the audience. The sentiments that I got, that was a strong signal from the Dutch business, which was advocating against any further sanctions uh, towards Russia. Because of well, the that's the liberals for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, you, you come from a different party. But exactly. It, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, apparently, you know, and there was also public opinion maybe that could have been favorable in terms of Russia, but now it's been changing after the MH17 and all the other developments. What's your view on that? How, how, is, how, how is the situation right now? Well, you know, MH17 did galvanize um, public opinion, but not necessarily towards sanctions. I think that was before, but it did bring home the point that a conflict which for many people is far, far away in a country they might have heard of but probably don't even know where it is, um, has a direct effect on their livelihood, on their families, on, on, on their loved ones. Um, you know, the, the, this, this, these were 298 people flying to the Far East for a holiday for business and were shot down over Ukraine um, as part of a conflict they knew nothing about. Um, and that had a huge, huge effect on, on, on feelings in Dutch society. Uh, and I think this is something that brought the nation together in a way that I haven't seen in my lifetime. I wish I wished there had been a 
co the cause for it, but it did show that we have strong determination, we have uh, a strong feeling as of being a society, which is something that is very, very valuable in Europe today. And we also have a strong feeling of, of responsibility for our own security. So in that sense, I believe there is now a greater sense of urgency as far as our collective security is concerned. And if I may respond, if I may, to, to the other points of, you know, you should be thinking globally, I think there's three points I'd like to make. We can only get our people in Europe to support global action if first we make sure that they're safe at home. And with what's happening in um, the Arab world with ISIS and with um, Russia brings insecurity to our homes uh, in Europe. So only, you know, if, if people feel that we are taking care of that problem first, they will give us the mandate to take care of it. That's my first point. The second point is, and it might be a bit of a painful point, but I need to make it anyway. Um, we've lost a lot of credibility in the last 15 years. I think the, the long-term effects of the Iraqi war uh, is, uh, are, you know, <coughs> causing a, a lack of conviction on two levels. Mm -hmm. The most important level is the moral level. You know, we did something um, on the basis of false information that was manipulated, and then we behaved in ways that we always said we would fight. Um, and when I say we, I, I, I say it purposefully. What happened at Abu Ghraib and elsewhere is something we all feel guilty about, regardless whether, it, and of course, we love to blame the Americans. But we are one community of values, and therefore, if those values are, 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 are blatantly violated in part of that community, it will affect the whole community. And I believe we have underestimated that effect. Um, on, I think the vote in the House of Commons on Syria would not have gone this way if this had not happened. Um, so the moral uh, problem with uh, what happened in Iraq and uh, afterwards. But there's also the second problem, which is the political problem. We did all that in Iraq, and it didn't work. Had it been effective, had it been a success, perhaps the moral issue might have been less uh, problematic, but the combination of acting against your own moral values and then not even succeeding in attaining your goals has been uh, deadly for the resolve of the West in acting internationally. So we need to solve the problem at home, which is a, 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 an imminent problem, and we need to be fully aware of the need to reinvigorate our moral stance and our political, um, our political successes. If I could just add to that, I, th I thought those, those were very, very important and underappreciated points. And I think um, it might have been Spignu Brzezinski who once wrote that sort of the power of the alliance and of the U and of U.S. global alliances is one of attraction. These are not, this is not a network of alliances where the United States is forcing countries, you know, to be in, to be in an alliance to, to contribute to each other's self-defense, et cetera. These are alliances that are of attraction and, 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 and uh, uh, sort of it's a community of values. And I think the Iraq war did much more damage to how other countries see the West. Uh, there are other factors too, including our own governance and fiscal crises. But I think the Iraq war did much more damage than we, fully, than we currently appreciate for this really important and intangible aspect of of, of the power of the alliance, and that is the, the sort of the values and the moral standing. The Iraq war, and I must say, the perceived double standards in the Middle East have a huge effect on our Muslim communities in Europe as well. Tobias? Yeah, that's definitely right, and I didn't want to imply that we should just go back and do that again. Um, on the other hand, I think that it's also true that um, we have, it's. It's, uh, it's really, it's not easy to, do, to draw the, the right lessons from Afghanistan, Iraq, and so on. Um, for instance, um, if we were talking now about Syria and so on, you said we wouldn't do that again. But I mean, in Syria, we did nothing, basically. And it has also not worked. So well, we have- That's right, yeah, but we yeah, did nothing yeah. because we 
Yeah, yeah, I know. We're afraid of our actions. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to underline that it's always damned if you do, damned if you exactly. don't, probably. Yeah. So uh, it's not, not an easy answer that we can find there. And that's even more important, I think, the point we made in our report is that we need this kind of uh, self-reflection again in the West because it's not only about Abu Ghraib. Um, it's, it's also about uh, issues like the NSA, it's about privacy, it's about security, it's, all, it's about all these basic values that are fundamental to our alliance and I think that this kind of debate is, right. is urgently needed. With this I would like to open the floor for questions and I see a hand here Katya and then the next question from Nino. Let's take three in a row and, and over there. Katja Gershak from Slovenia. Um, you really bring out the key points in, in my view, and I thank you for that, particularly on the issue of credibility. And in the past decades, um, we're, we're used to us setting the rules. I mean, generally, we've shaped the world in the West. And um, I think the moment has come when now this is gonna be challenged globally. Um, and from my point of view, what I really want to know and what's going to affect all of us in this room in the coming decades is how are we going to respond to this? Are we going to fight this? Or and are we going to self-reflect and realize that building global partnerships is going to probably require making compromises on some of the norms that we've set globally? Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know? Just wait. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Nina Gogoladze from Georgia. Um, actually, my question reflects to the question of previous um, delegate. We are now facing the situation when the West and the Russia uh, talk different languages. The West talks uh, the language of values, Russia talks uh, language of violence. So there is a huge gap. How are we going to bridge the gap? Because eventually, at some point, we need to start talking with each other mm -hmm. because we can't really solve all the problems uh, with military ways. But at the same time, if we speak different languages, how are we going to understand each other? Thank, Thank you. you. And good point. Well, question from Bulgaria. Yes, Georgi Michev, Bulgaria. Uh, I was provoked uh, uh, by the talk of uh, Mr. Barry Powell about uh, Silicon Valley. What do you think? Uh, what will be after 10 or 20 years uh, by the development of these uh, biotechnologies and different innovations. We will have maybe a bulletproof uh, soldiers, like uh, very, very um, unpredictable for nowadays uh, innovations. What will be the world after 10 years, 20 years in the warfare? And also, uh, if there are some medicines that will give her more and more years life, Maybe a population will be more than uh, seven million uh, billions. Overcrowded will be. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Maybe each one of you could just comment on some of the questions we raised, just one by one. Sure. To yes, please. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm always fascinated by the, this question: Why are we always surprised by this? Why don't we know that? And I believe there is something very funny going on in the last 10, 15 years with our information society and I, I always I want to reflect on this with you um, because you are some of you most of you are very young and 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 remind me of the students I had when I was professor at university and your outlook on the world is completely different because you have unlimited access to an unlimited amount of information um, which is great but um, analyzing does not come naturally to this generation and and i think what we could bring to the table is is we were forced to analyze more because finding information the process of finding information was very hard so by looking for information you were forced to already select and analyze and you're, you're no longer forced to do that we are weak seeing a lot of things at the same time your generation is very very good at that we need to combine those two skills better than we did before which by which I'm trying to say this. Have we tried to look through Russia's eyes? Have we done this? Have we <clears throat> analyzed their motives? Have we analyzed what's behind all this? I think we haven't. I think we haven't. And why is it that, especially in politics, looking through somebody else's eyes is today seen as weak, as compromising, as, 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 being, as, being, as being sort of a chamberlain? That's not what it's all about. As a diplomat, I say, if I want to defeat someone in negotiations, 
I need to know what makes them tick, what their position is, what their values are, what they'd stand to lose, etc., etc. We need to look more at those societies. We need to analyze what's happening in Russia. And only if we know that, why is all this happening, can we draw conclusions on our reaction to that. And especially in the Muslim world, what is happening in the Arab world? What is happening? Why are these young, highly educated people in, 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 in Brixton or in, in, in The Hague or in Amsterdam making these, in our view, completely ludicrous choices? Why? Do we know what's happening in the, do the do the community themselves know what is happening in their own community? No, we don't. We need to we need to reinvent this idea that we want to know what's going on in somebody else's head and heart. Mm, thank you. Barry? Well, I think it's a really important point. Um, again, uh, I'm not just playing to the audience, but I'm not sure I agree that this is not an analytical generation as well. I think there are, they are... Uh, present company excluded. Present company excluded. <laughs> no, but I think this is... I mean, information is so much more readily available, I think it actually puts a premium on... I mean, the people in this room are in this room because they are, you know, super analytical and they were chosen from a much broader cohort. Um, I think the key is how do we sort of separate the useful information from the less useful. But I think, the, I, I mean, I think the analysis that we can bring to bear today is greater than it was even five, um, five, ten years ago. I mean, on the question about what's coming, boy, I, I would be uh, paid a, a, lot, a lot higher salary if I knew the answer to that. <laughs> But I do see, I mean, we spend a lot of time at the Atlanta Council on what we call strategic foresight, which is imagining the different menu of futures. We're spending a lot of that time on these disruptive technologies. And it's really very different, just as it's different 10 years ago from today. If you project forward 10 years, it's going to be even more different because of these other technologies. I mentioned additive manufacturing, which I consider the democratization of production. Um, I think biotech is now going to be sort of the democratization of the ability to, to develop and, and change biological organisms for good. There will be lots more elderly people. There will be a lot more um, uh, cure, a, a, a lot fewer sort of uh, uh, chronic diseases um, from what I'm being told. But these also can be used, these capabilities, for very, very dark purposes. And, the, and a lot more people are now experimenting with biological organisms than ever before. This worries me, and I know it worries uh, uh, the US Pentagon. I also worry about sort of uh, comparative ethics. I'm not as worried, even though some might because of the NSA scandal, about the US government sort of ac activity in this area in terms of empowerment and human enhancement. I'm really worried about the Beijing Institute for Genomics mm -hmm. and what the Chinese military does when they learn about insights from, from this type of uh, of technology, and I don't, I don't think they'll have any hesitation applying it for military purposes, whereas I think the values that we've, that most of us are familiar with in this room would sort of cause great concern and caution about going too far in this area, et cetera. So I mean, it's a very short answer to a very complex mm -hmm. um, question. I, I don't remember the details of your question, but my short answer is we need a new conversation with our, between our leaders and our people because the capabilities that are available, we, we need a new social compact. With all that's going on, with all this flux in the world, we are not gonna guess every type of challenge. ISIS seemingly came out of nowhere, but we can always look back and see where it came from. My point is, we're gonna be surprised again, we're gonna have surprise attacks. Uh, the whole society needs to be involved across the alliance and how we prepare for and deal with working through these attacks and then bouncing back to deal with them. But I, I think we need a whole new social compact um, that uh, not only related to surveillance right. and security, but to other points as well. Thank you, Barry. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. We're having a very special guest soon. So I would like to thank our panelists for joining us today. We had a very good discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.